I want to introduce uh, someone who's going to introduce our keynote speaker. I want to bring up Alex Rosenberg. He's the manager of platform architecture for Sony PlayStation. So uh, I got asked who from the games industry should come talk to this crowd. Uh, you know, the games industry is largely, well, the console game industry is largely C++ based. So really there's only one name for me, and that's uh, who we're going to see today, Mike Acton, who is Engine Director at Insomniac Games. Um, I don't know if you know their titles, but uh, they've done some like Resistance and Ratchet and & Clank and um, Fuse and uh, Sunset Overdrive is their new one. Um, they pretty reliably put out two console games a year, which if you have no frame of reference is a Herculean effort. Um, you know, hundreds of people are involved in these things and uh, getting it to all happen on schedule is very challenging. And um, that's uh, a core part of what Mike does there. He's also been responsible for uh, quite a bit of technology sharing in the games industry. Um, first uh, thing I have in my head is the cell performance website, which was for people to working on the cell chips that we used in the PlayStation 3, as well as uh, researchers who were using them. And then, uh, more recently, Mike did Alt Dev Blog a Day, where he encouraged people from the games industry to write a single blog entry each day uh, on a uh, common shared website. So there was always something to read. And uh, as well, at, on Insomniac's page, there's uh, papers on various research they've done and things that they've had success with. Uh, it's all been fascinating reading. And uh, with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Mike Acton. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Um, thanks, Alex. Uh, so yes, I'm Mike Acton. I'm engine director at Insomniac Games. Um, how many people here are game developers? OK, so um, that's a relatively small minority of you. Um, so I want to give a little bit of background anticipating that um, on what, what I do, what, or what our team does in the context of uh, making games. Um, so we, as a team, generally build the runtime systems, the, especially the systems that um, require the most uh, performance, um, are the most used in, in a game as far as the, the amount of data that's, that's being transformed. Um, so examples are the rendering system, um, animation and gestures, streaming, cinematics, visual effects, post effects, navigation, localization, basically all the big kind of systems that are not specifically um, the game itself. Uh, we also do all the development tools. Um, so the tools that we use inside the studio as a studio to make the game. So the level creation tools, the lighting tools, the material editing tools, uh, visual effects creation tools, animation, state machine tools for our animators, visual scripting, scene painting, cinematics, tons and tons of tools, hundreds of tools um, that we make and develop as a team um, to let the rest of the, the team, sort of the hundreds of people, as Alex mentioned, who are working on releasing, releasing our games. Um, so we're both on the console and very concerned with the um, characteristics of that machine as well as on our PC development side um, in concern with, with the characteristics of our development machines. Um, so I wanted to give you an idea sort of, of our values and the things that are important to us um, as we are developing these things. Um, so hard, hard deadlines are critical to us. Um, we know when we're going to ship a game to the day, I can tell you right now, Sunset Overdrive will be on the shelf on October 28th. Um, and we knew that, you know, know those dates within a very small window well in advance of, of shipping the game. Um, and so we have multiple games in flight. We know when they're going to ship. Um, we have millions of dollars of marketing money depending on, you know, the pipeline of shipping that game. So there's no missing this. There's no flexibility here. It ships, it's on the shelf on this day, you know, you know, a couple of years in advance, roughly, um, when it's going to ship. So you have to scale the fit. You have to make sure it's going to work. Um, soft real-time performance requirements. Uh, so. You know, generally speaking, as a game, that's you know going to either be 16 you know things within a frame, or either going to be 16 
milliseconds or 33 milliseconds, roughly. Um, so and that's the kinds of time frames that we live in. Um, generally speaking, when we're looking at anything in particular, we're going to be talking about um, microseconds. And if we're talking milliseconds, we're talking about fairly large sets of, of uh, uh, transformations, very significant systems. Um, but generally, when we're looking at things, we're, we're talking in, in microseconds. So that's the kind of time range we're talking about when we're talking about our game performance. Um, usability, um, we have so many people trying to you know, build a game, build it rapidly. Um, huge games, hopefully much bigger than uh, is represented by the actual number of people on, on the development team. Um, so we need to make sure that our tool side and our system and everything, um, both for the programmers and for the non-programmers, the artists, the designers, sound engineers, et cetera, um, are easy and quick for them to use. Um, performance in general um, is critical to us. Um, you, uh, the, the faster that so anything is, either a process or some s system running on a piece of hardware, um, the more space you have for other things. Um, and that's critical to us. We have, you know, we want to solve new problems, and in order to solve new problems, we have to make space for them. Um, and as I said, we have that window in a frame, that 16 milliseconds or 33 millisecond space. Um, and so if we want to put more stuff in there, we've got to make space for it. Performance, performance is king. Um, maintenance in general, um, you know, we have to maintain it, we have to continue, we have, um, we have multiple games in flight. We continue with the development of the engine and tools over time, over games. Um, so we have to make sure it's maintainable from our point of view. Uh, debuggability, uh, again, we, don't, you know, we, ha we have hardship dates. We have to make sure that we can solve problems you know, right before gold, you know, right when everything is coming together, that those things can solve quickly. Um, so being able to reason about what's gone, gone wrong is crucial to us. Um, what languages do we use? Um, as Alex said, the industry is dominated by C++, um, and that's no less true for us, um, but we do use a lot of other languages in the mix, uh, a little bit of C, um, a little bit of assembly, uh, Perl, JavaScript, C Sharp, um, obviously not all of these on the actual console target, but on our PC development side. Um, I'd say uh, give, uh, for our whole code base, C++ probably represents about 70% of our code base. Um, that's a rough estimate. I didn't actually count lines of code or anything. Um, our, certainly our most preferred target would be assembly. Like that would be the thing that we would love to just work in all the time. Um, but reality, of course, um, means that we use tools that help us do that rather than doing it directly for all the things, especially at scale. Um, there's also random other things, um, pixel shaders, vertex shaders, all the sort of GPU stuff, geometry shaders, compute shaders, a lot more work going on in this space now. Um, and to connect with the keynote yesterday, um, we definitely don't make games that go to Mars, um, but there's a lot of similarities between what we do um, and what I understood that, uh, that JPL did in their embedded system for the rover. Um, so how are games like the Mars rovers? Um, exceptions. Um, in a similar way, um, we avoid them. We, we turn them off um, if we can at all help it. Occasionally there's a third-party library, some th other third-party code that we have to interact with that's designed around them, so we'll sandbox it off. Um, templates, while we don't have a hard rule that says no templates, um, we do have a, I, you know, I have a particular face that I might give someone if they use one, um, and it's not a happy face. Um, so we, there's occasionally a good, you know, good use, but most of the time what it is is a poor use, um, and most of the time it slows things down. Um, certainly anybody who's worked with templates at scale where a code base that's heavily relied on them knows how it cripples compile times. Um, IO stream in particular, um, while we do use the standard out um, mechanism for our sort of TTY and debug debugging info on the console as well as on the, on the development PCs, <coughs> we don't use the C++ specific implementation IO stream. Um, multiple inheritance, that's right out. That's not even a question. Like, that's just dumb. Um, operator overloading. Uh, so we don't, again, unlike 
the, the JPL project, we don't have a strict rule about no over, operator overloading, overloading, but you will get the frowny face or the angry face, depending on how complex that overloading is. Um, for a you know, rule of thumb is if it's super obvious what you're doing, we tend to let it go. So adding a couple of vectors, it's super obvious what that's gonna get transformed into. Okay, we'll let it go. Um, but anything sort of significantly more complicated than that uh, will be heavily frowned on. Um, runtime type information, that's off the table. Uh, we definitely don't use STL um, to go back to the question of templates um, and compile times, but also because we found, generally speaking, it's not that we have a replacement for STL that we think is somehow magically better, it's that it doesn't actually solve the problems that we want to solve, and we want to solve the problems we, we have. Um, custom allocators in the same way, um, we don't have a sort of general Dynamic, we don't use the general dynamic heap management. Um, we allocate all the memory up front. We divide it into sort of a set of hierarchies, and each sort of sandbox manages, this, manages it, the data in its own way that's appropriate to its system. Um, so we have tons of custom allocators that will work inside those sandboxes. Some of them, maybe that sort of familiar kind of um, heap management inside of a sandbox block. Some maybe small block allocators. Some may be um, sort of linear allocators for systems that just need to sort of linear burn through and then reset. We have tons and tons of different things. Uh, custom debugging tools, again, back to debuggability. We have a lot of tools that sort of introspect into our data um, and you know, look, either pull it over to the development PC from the console so that we can examine it. Um, uh, we have tools that do examination live. We have tools that do examination offline and sort of dump a bunch of data so that we can analyze it. Tons and tons of debugging tools. Um, so in a lot of ways, uh, because they, well, you know, a, the Mars Rover project is a sort of very small embedded system with very limited resources and certainly a console at the scope of PS4 or Xbox One is much, much bigger by comparison. Um, they share a lot of similar properties, right? They are fi these sort of fixed resources, um, and you want to take advantage of those resources. So in, in that way, we end up at the same, a lot of the same places. Um, so back to the title, this data-oriented thing. Uh, what does it mean? Is it even a thing? Is it, like a th is it, is it a process? What does it mean? Um, so I want to talk, when I say it, I want to talk a little bit about what I mean. Um, and fundamentally, uh, this is something that I, it's not, it's just a fact, right? I don't, it's not a belief. The purpose of all programs and all parts of those programs is to transform data from one form to another. Physical fact, that's the point. Um, but this is sort of the reminding principle of what, why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and to that end, if you don't understand the data that you're transforming, right, you don't understand the problem at all. Um, conversely, you understand a problem better by understanding the data that you're working with. Um, and different problems, this should be obvious, require different solutions, right? Everybody should agree with that. Um, so if you have different data, you have a different problem, right, which require a different solution. Um, if you don't understand the cost of solving the problem, you don't understand the problem, right? If you can't reason about the cost of the things you're doing, you don't really understand the problem. Um, if you don't understand the hardware, you can't reason about the cost of understanding the problem. Um, every piece of hardware, every, every imaginary set of hardware that you're going to be working with is finite and has some range of performance characteristics. Um, and that's the only way to consider how you're going to solve it is to consider those characteristics. Um, and everything, universally, is a data problem, including usability, maintenance, debuggability, et cetera. Every, everything is a data problem. It's not a code problem. Uh, and solving problems you probably don't have uh, creates more problems you definitely do. Um, so avoid adding problems to the space that you, you don't have. And you know what problems you have because you have analyzed the data. Um, and latency and throughput are only the same in sequential systems. Uh, and just some rules of thumb. Uh, where there's one, there are many. So, you know, as a rule of thumb, you look in the time axis if you can, um, and you solve the most common problem first, which is, you know, I have a bunch of these things that are definitely going to happen over time. That's the most common issue. That's the one I should manage, as opposed to trying to imagine that, you, you know, this one thing exists in a vacuum. 
Um, rule of thumb, the more context you have, the better you can make the solution. So don't throw away data or constraints that you need. Um, you want to know more about where something is going to be used, how it's going to be used, what data it, you know, is acceptable, what ranges are acceptable in order to make an appropriate solution. Um, and I think fundamentally for us, um, this sort of concept, this non-uniform memory access, and, you know, access concept extends over time for us as well, um, where it's not just on the console, but the data that's on the console also, you know, we conceptually view it as extends to, you know, the hard disk of which would be read and the Blu-ray which will have served that, and then back to the development PC, that data got built from uh, a source data which was then built from you know Maya or whatever or our development tools all the sort of all the way back to the original artists with the mouse right um, or keyboard so there is this sort of stream of input over time and we have to manage that entire pipeline um, and understand the cost of <coughs> data access throughout that entire pipeline over time not just this sort of we don't look at it in a vacuum and sort of this individual access at this one point in time um, and most importantly, I think, software does not run in a magic fairy ether powered by the fever dreams of CS PhDs. Uh, it's a real, software's real engineering that runs on real hardware um, to solve a real problem. Um, and ultimately, reason must prevail. Like if what we're doing is unreasonable for any reason um, or imaginary, then it has to go. So. Uh, that hopefully gives you some context of what I mean when I say data oriented. Um, so is it, a, is it a thing? Well, it's certainly not, these are not new ideas, right? There's nothing in here that's new or news. Um, it's really just a reminder for, for me, for others, of sort of those first principles. Um, and, you know, reminding us what's most important, concentrate on that, get rid of everything else. Um, but to a large degree, the only reason we're talking about this, the only reason I've ever talked about this, um, is just because it has been a response to the broader culture that C++ has engendered. Um, and most prevalently is what, are what I call the th three big lies. And those are, lie one, that software is a platform in and of itself. Uh, lie two, that code should be, should be designed around a model of the world, just or your mental model of the world. And third lie is that uh, code is more important than data. So, lie number one, software is a platform. Uh, this should be super, super obvious, right? Hardware is the platform, right? Um, you have text, you have data, goes into some CPU, spits out other data, like that's, that's the point. Um, different hardware, different solutions. You have a different set of hardware, the solution is, is by necessity going to be different. If I have a six, if I'm programming for a 6502 versus a cell, versus the you know, uh, ATI 5870, um, versus some ARM, versus some, you know, uh, a room, for a server farm full of processors, right? X64 processors. These solutions in each case are going to be entirely different um, because they're different hardware platforms. They have different constraints, different physical constraints apply. You cannot make a solution independent of the actual platform or set, finite set of platforms that you're working for. Um, so uh, reality is not a hack. Right? It's not something you're forced to deal with to solve your abstract theoretical problem. Reality is the actual problem that you're trying to solve. Right? It doesn't make your code less nice that you had to actually do something with actual data on a real actual platform to make it actually work. Like, that's the point. That's the thing it should do. Um, so if you think you know, the right way is, is some way other than the way that actually works in context, then you, your idea of the right way is wrong. Um, lie two, uh, code is, should, be, should be designed around the model of the world. This one sort of has trickled into the C++ culture from that sort of object-oriented space, right? Um, and sort of building up that model of the world and trying to codify that, um, in that process, hiding data is implicit, right? Um, that's sort of what <coughs> most people would, would even suggest is the point of it. Um, but this is bad. It confuses two things, two important things. One is the maintenance. 
um, which is a good thing. Like we want to be able to maintain changes to our access to the data. Great. But it confuses that with understanding the properties of the data. Um, what is the data? How does it work? How big is it? What, you know, what's in there? This is, this is going to be the most important thing that we need to know in order to actually solve problems. And confusing these two things, or confounding these two things, um, means at the cost, potentially at the cost of slightly better maintenance, we have now made our problems um, very, very difficult to solve, um, or at least to solve well. Um, and this whole idea of world modeling implies some, some relationship to real data or transforms, right? Um, it's you know, as though uh, if I have some model of the world and I codify it like that, that's actually the thing that's happening. Um, but in, in, the problem is that in real life, classes of things, right, are fundamentally similar. They, have re they are really are the same. Um, a chair is a chair in real life. Um, but in terms of data transformations, in terms of what we do, um, these classes are really only superficially similar. Um, so, you know, in our context, sorry, in the context of a game, you know, we have a chair and a physics chair and a static chair and a breakable chair. These things are not at all similar. Like, there's almost nothing that's the same in between these, these contexts, right? Um, how they're handled, how the data is managed, how the data is transformed. There's virtually nothing that is the same here. Um, and yet, the tendency would be because they share some world modeling similarities, or similarities in the real world, that they ought to be connected somehow in, in, uh, in sort of the code hierarchy, which is nonsensical, to be honest. Um, so world modeling in general leads to these sort of monolithic, unrelated data structures and transforms, um, leading to all kinds of other problems that you shouldn't have in the first place. Um, so from, from my perspective, I think that you know, world modeling is trying to sort of idealize the problem away, sort of back to there is no software ether that we're running in that we, you know, we really need to understand the data and the hardware that we're working on. You can't make a problem simpler than it actually is. Right? The actual reality is you have this finite set of hardware. The actual reality is you have this finite set of data. You can't make it simpler than that. Um, and I sort of see world modeling as the equivalent of self-help books for programming. It's sort of like trying to, trying to engineer by analogy or engineer by storytelling as opposed to engineer by engineering. Um, and that <laughs> makes it, you know, not as good. Um, lie three, that code is somehow, for some reason, more important than the data, that we spend so much time focusing on the code. So much time talking about, you know, in, we're all here, honestly, to talk about the code, right? Um, so much development time and brain power spent talking about the code, when the vast majority of the time the code is not the real issue. The code is a minor, minor issue in, the, of all, in all the things that we work with. It really is the, the data that we're dealing with is the thing that we, we are reasoning about and the thing that's the actual problem. Um, as I said before, the only purpose of any code is to transform data, right? It's got to get it from this form into this form. Um, whether that, you know, at a high level, it's from like di data on disk and, and player input into what's on the screen and the speakers, you know, all, you know, and that's sort of hierarchically down to the systems and the things that are transforming data inside the system. And the programmer uh, is fun fundamentally responsible for that data. Right? Fundamentally responsible to make sure that transform happens, happens correctly, happens fast, happens in a maintainable way. Um, not the code. Right? The code is the tool that we use to do the transformation. So the programmer's job is not to write code. Um, and I think people really, really don't want to believe this. Like, it's not your job. Code isn't, writing the code is not a job. Writing the code is the tool you use to do your job. Uh, your job is to solve data transformation problems. Right? Solve the, solving the problem is the job. Um, so to that end, right, only write code that has direct provable values that transforms the data that you need to transform in a meaningful way. Um, and in order to do that, you have to understand the data so you can understand the problem so they can solve it appropriately. Uh, which means that there is no ideal abstract solution to the problem. There is not. You can pretend there is, um, but there is in fact not. 
Uh, you cannot future-proof. This is just a trap that people fall in. But they could believe this whole idea that I can just make some code and it will last forever across all imaginary systems that could ever happen in the future. Right? That's simply not possible. Like, there is going to be some finite range which you have, you have not accounted for. Uh, we're not going to take, for instance, an engine that somebody developed for uh, SNES or Atari 2600 and try to put it on the PS4 um, and develop the same kind of games. The problem has fundamentally changed over time. Uh, so, to recap the lies, Lie one, software is a platform. Lie two, code should be designed around the model of the world. And lie three, code is more important than the data. Um, so what problems do these lies cause? Generally, the things that you'll see, the things that I certainly see, are poor performance, poor concurrency, poor optimizability, poor stability, poor testability. Um, so we build up all this other infrastructure on top in order to try to solve these problems that we've created for ourselves. So. Solve for transforming the data that you have, given the constraints of the platform, and nothing else. Just do that. Let's look at just a simple example to help put this in some context. Um, dictionary lookup. Um, I have some keys, I have some values, I have sort of a key value pair, and I want to get the value given a key, right? Um, in a traditional sort of code, if I'm thinking about the code first, this table is what I expect to see in memory, more or less. Um, you know, the key and the value will be will be associated with each other because in the mental model of the programmer, they are associated together as a key value pair, right? Um, uh, but the problem is, the reality is that they're not actually associated together. The most common operation is, you know, if we had analyzed it, would be the search on the key, right? And if we look at that, what's the statistical chance um, that we will need value on any given key as we're sort of iterating this list. And it's very low, right? It's only on the one hit that we have. Most of the time, we are not going to need the value. Most of the time, we're going to be iterating through the keys. That's what the data tells us. That's what the problem actually is. And these two things are not actually associated with each other um, directly. So uh, what happens is that this scales toward the worst case. As you have more keys and more values, it gets less performant per pair. Um, and you end up loading, you know, as you're iterating the keys, you're loading the value, each, and each value into decache, and you're immediately throwing it away, right? Because the vast majority of the time, you're not using it at all. Um, so you're wasting quite a bit of your, your bandwidth on your machine. You're doing things that are unnecessary because of your mental model. The reality is this is more about what the actual process is like, right? We have some keys, I want to find a key. From that I get an index and from that I can get my values from a table. Like that's the actual process that we actually want to have then, the vast majority of the time. Um, and in this case, the keys are stored together, right? Cache will be loaded with the most likely data that we'll actually need in reality, um, the next key. And the, while the one hit for the value is probably cold, um, and will require cache miss. It's that one, only one, and it's, the, and it's a statistically rare case. So conceptually, what we want to do is solve for the most common case first, right? The most common actual re real uh, live case first, um, and not the most generic. Uh, and can't the compiler do it, right? Um, this is the, you know, I, you know, I imagine, I can just imagine this meeting tonight on, you know, what can, what, what else can they, what else can they, the C++ community add to the fucking, like, add to the language uh, <laughs> to make it solve our problems for us, right? Um, so let's just do a little review on what the compiler can and can't do and what our role actually is here. Um, so some instruction time just for context. Um, so looking at AMD power driver times, square root traditionally thought of as an incredibly expensive instruction, you know, is somewhere in the, you know, 15 to 20 um, uh, cycle latency. <coughs> Most expensive instructions on in this particular architecture are gonna be the transcendental, um, so we're gonna see them in the, say, 100 cycle range. The vast majority of our functions, 99 plus percent of our instructions are not going to be these, right? This is going to be occasional instruction. Um, uh, but this is just sort of context for the time frames that we're working with in terms of latency. 
Um, however, um, in terms of memory access, let's look at our time frames. So reading from a register is essentially free. Reading from L1, I cache or decache is going to be roughly, say, three cycles. And then we're talking the, this. These numbers come from Jason Gregory, who's at Naughty Dog working on uh, PS4. But generally, you know, in rough numbers, we'll apply to pretty much any, let's say, uh, X, let's call it X64 architecture platform. Um, so three cycles for L1 caches. Going to L2 is about 20 cycles, and going to main RAM is going to be 200 plus cycles, and, all, and, and often much slower. But for the sake of um, our estimates, let's call it 200. Um, so to give you some idea of how, what that means, so L, an L1 access is like this. All right, it's pretty fast. An L2 access is like this. Right? and main RAM access to scale. Whew. Right, all right. So in, in, in reality, right, if we look at a code, the vast majority of the, you know, the, the, the time that we're, we're spending, the most significant in the, you know, in the most significant component analysis of our, of our uh, instruction stream is going to be these L2 cache misses. The vast majority of our time is going to be spent waiting that incredibly slow process from RAM. Um, uh, and that's not even including these other issues, right? The, the, the shared memory modes between, say, GPU and CPU or different, different CPU um, uh, types on the same platform, what, you know, what modes those are in, whether or not they're cacheable or write combined or whatever, or these all change the characteristics of memory access. Um, so to that end, let's look at a very simple example. I hope everybody can read this. Um, so a little, little imaginary example. We have a, I, this sort of typical kind of game object that has 2D position, 2D velocity, some kind of fixed length name, some pointer to a model, and some foo variable, right? Uh, it's not important, but it's just some monolithic kind of game object. Imagine it's some derived from some other things in oh, the typical kind of object-oriented way. And we have this function, update foo, right? And all it's going to do is, uh, uh, take the you know take take the square root of the square of the of the the, the components of the velocity, um, and multiply that by the, some f that you passed in and assign it um, increment foo with it. Right, that's that's pretty much it. Just simple simple function. We think that looking at it, right, the the tradition is to look at it and say, well, that that square root is the problem. Right, that's the problem. What we already saw. That's not really the problem. That's a very that's in the in the order of magnitude we're talking about here. Right, that's at least one order of magnitude less than uh, from one access to main RAM. Um, so that's really really not the problem. Um, so let's look at what does that output. Right, what you're running through the compiler. What does that actually output? So let's note a couple of things here. Um, so we have two 32-bit reads. Here, they're, they're, you can see they're stacked right next to each other, um, 8 and 12 uh, byte offsets. So those are going to be probably on the same cache line. So let's call that uh, 200 cycles. Um, we have a float mole add here. Um, let's call that's going to come out to about 10 cycles. Um, let's let's assume the square root is just called directly here, um, and that's going to come round out. Let's let's be generous and call it 30 cycles, um, and. The uh, multiply back um, to the same address, so that's already going to be an L1, so let's call it around three cycles. Um, and the read add, final read add to the new line, that M foo, um, is a new line, new cache line, that's going to be 200 cycles, right? So clearly the work here, the actual time, is in that initial, that initial read and this final read, uh, this final read add. Um, so the time spending in just the simple function, uh, for L2 miss versus the actual work that we're doing is approximately 10 to 1. Um, this one space here um, is the space that the compiler lives in. 
This is this when we're talking about what the compiler does. Um, this is the space. Um, this is this this is the th area that it can reason about. About 10% of your performance, roughly. Um, so, uh, in, you know, in a real problem, in a real problem space, compiler can reason somewhere in the space of one to ten percent of your problem space. Um, the vast majority of problems, the vast majority of problem space, are the things that the compiler simply cannot reason about, um, because the compiler is a tool, not a magic wand, right? It does what you tell it to do. It does it in very predictable ways, usually very predictable ways. Um, but it cannot solve the most significant problems that you have. It just, it simply can't. And that's not honestly what it's intended to do. Um, so today's subject is really that kind of 90% problem space um, that we need to solve that the compiler can't. Um, and how uh, we can help the compiler with that sort of 10% of the problem space that it can solve. Uh, so there's some really simple and obvious things that we can look for. And back of the envelope calculations that we can do to get substantial wins overall. Um, this is not really complex stuff. Like we can just take a look at it um, and make reasoned judgments up front. And anyone who wants to say premature optimization right now can leave the room because that is the most abused quote of all time. Uh, so L2 caches per frame, we don't want to waste them. Frame for us is again back to that 60 millisecond or 33 millisecond sort of cycle. Um, so in terms of this particular function that we're looking at, right, let's, let's reason about the waste. So uh, we had, uh, we're wasting approximately 56 bytes out of the 64-byte 64 uh, 64 cache line, assuming that we have a 64-byte cache line. Your architecture or set of architectures may be different. <coughs> but we're not, re we're not using 56 bytes out of that. And we're wasting, in this case, 60 bytes out of our 64-byte cache line. We're just not using it. Um, so it's about a 90% waste of our reads. Um, or alternatively, we can view that as about 10% about of the capacity of the line between main RAM and L2 here um, is used. The rest is just noise coming across the line. Um, it's not so, 10% used is not the same as saying 10% used well, um, but we'll start, we'll start here. Like, let's just get that number up a little bit. Um, so. How do we use our capacity a little bit better? Um, well, the simplest way um, is to make sure that we're getting, you know, all, that whole line is filled with data that we actually need. So if we do a very simple transformation of the data, um, and we say, all right, well, I have, I'm not just dealing with one, I'm going to definitely be dealing with many of these. It's very unlikely in any given situation that I'm dealing, that one thing exists in a vacuum. The most common case is I have multiple, so I may as well transform them together. And if I'm transforming them together, I may as well pack them into the same cache line so they can take advantage of the capacity that I have. Um, so in this case, we have this foo update in structure, um, which packs the velocity in mfoo, which is the thing we actually read, the thing we actually care about for this transform. Um, and we have our output mfoo in a structure, um, and that's the thing that we actually want to, the, the actual result for each one of these. Um, so we process count number of these. Um, so if we look at, you know, we're looking at about, you know, about how many can we fit on a cache line. So five of these is gonna be over one cache line, so 72 um, bytes. Uh, five of the output is gonna be under one cache line, um, which is 20 bytes. So um, how do we, make, you know, can we arrange this so it's a little bit better? Sure, easily enough. We just do 32 of them at a time, or some multiple of 32. And that comes out really well, um, because that's six cache lines for our input and two cache lines for our output. Totally packed, totally full, 100% of the capacity between, between main RAM and L2 use for, that, for those particular requests. Um, so if we look for our, our input cache lines, we say, um, all right, so we have six, six cache line reads, um, 32 uh, iterations. That tells us that uh, we can do about 5.33 loops through this per cache line read. Um, so we want to reason about whether or not we fit in here. Um, so we're looking at, okay, what, what, what else are we doing? Uh, under those reads, we're doing some square roots, some math here. We've already looked at that cost. Let's call that about 40 cycles. Um, so times 5.33 gives us about 213 cycles of actual work 
per cache line. And if we're, our estimate was about 200 cycles per cache line read, um, that comes out pretty well. Um, uh, it's roughly equivalent, so at this point, we're, we're probably going, going to be waiting on um, our uh, actual instructions here for a few cycles. However, on the x64 in particular, we get a streaming prefetch bonus for what we're doing here. Um, so it'll probably be faster and we'll still be bound by the capacity of the line. Um, but it'll be pretty close. Pretty close, 200, pretty close to our input. So well within the range of it's good enough for, for our purposes here. Right, hope that makes sense. Um, but just sort of simple transform and reasoning at a high level on you know, how, are, how much of capacity is being used, how it's being used, um, these two approximately 10 times speed up in this particular transform. Um, and that is just a lot, that, that, that the line is used, not that it's used as efficiently as possible, just that you're using it at all and you don't have 90% waste of the line. So in addition, you know, looking at this code, it's, you know, it's manageable, it's debuggable. We can reason, reason, really reason about the cost of change. This is here for a reason. Um, this is here because we understand the cost of what we're doing. So when we go to make a change, we understand, we can understand what it's going to cost us. Where in the previous example, um, it's very difficult to reason about the cost of change. So the, the, the cost goes up. Um, ignoring inconvenient facts, saying I don't want to know this stuff about the capacity of my lines and how data cache works and what my finite set of hardware actually is. Even if I'm doing, you know, ostensibly portable stuff, you still have a finite set of hardware that you're talking about. I don't want to reason about any of this. Um, uh, but the reality is ignoring facts that are inconvenient is not engineering, that's dogma. Right? We have to take the reality into account in order to do the work, the job that we're doing. Uh, it's only professional. Um, so some common issues. Um, just to go through some other examples. Um, bulls and structs. Uh, something you see all the time, people putting bulls in structs. Um, let's just reason a little bit about the cost of doing this. Uh, so let's assume that it's, we, ha we have at least packed it, right? We have at least said the bulls are packed. Um, and they're not going to be aligned by the next type. So we can, at the very least, we can say that this has an extremely low information density. Like a bool represents a bit, um, and we are taking up a whole byte for it, so we're wasting at least seven of those bits, minimally. Um, but you know, the worst problem is not just the, that seven bits waste, but that we're probably pushing something else beyond our cache line read. So looking, you know, looking here, you know, we've, so, this value has pushed some other values out. Um, so now, you know, say our inherent scale value in this particular structure is pushed out to a second cache line. So now our cost, we have to do this sort of 400 cycles of reads um, effectively in order to read that one bit. So that one bit cost us an extra 200 cycles to read one of these values, which is ridiculous. Um, so bools are also, uh, a common source of problems in sort of last minute decision making. Um, so look at, we'll look at this very, very simple case, obviously contrive. Um, hope you can reason about this, right? Uh, really, if M, this, we imagine that there's this, this, this uh, member, uh, M need parent update, um, that if this is true or whatever, assuming the type is bool, um, then it's effectively going to return the absolute value of count, right? You can reason about that. Um, this is a very, it's a very poor way of doing a very simple instruction. Um, but it's the kind of thing that we'd see over time, spread, in, spread into code. Um, it wouldn't be unusual to see this kind of thing, maybe some other things embedded in it, but this kind of thing to actually exist. So how does the compiler reason about this? So MSVC, what does that do? Um, so, Again, looking at this, I'm sure you can optimize this in your head, right? It's very, very simple. The compiler, however, in MSVC in this case, um, at uh, probably um, uh, O2 at this point, or the equivalent of O2, um, does what is effectively extremely naive transformation. Um, does the reread and retest of that member variable every time through the loop, does the increment and loop. Um, so. It's about, it's about the worst way that I could imagine doing that function. 
Um, so why? Why does it do it this way? Um, we can, unfortunately, right, closed source environment, we can only guess. Uh, maybe extra super conservative aliasing rules in our scenario, although that seems unlikely for other reasons. Um, imagining that the memory variable might change, who knows? The fact is, it happens. Um, so let's look at Clang. What, is it, what does Clang do, at least 3.4 in the scenario? Okay, great, it's a little more aggressive. Um, and uh, it gives us a better result, right? Just does the test once in return and effectively returns us the, the absolute value. So it does the right thing, does what we expect, great. Um, so what about something marginally more complicated but still well within the range of the things that we would actually see in reality? Um, so we have effectively we're calling the same function that we just, we just created um, inside a loop that does the exact same thing, right? So this whole thing should fold down to exactly the same thing we saw before, right? Take a look at that. Imagine, right? The optimization of BAS in this case should be exactly what we saw on the previous slide. It's just a marginally more complex way of doing exactly the same thing. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's an important lesson to understand that, you know, compilers are not magic. Um, and the whole idea that you know they can they can they can do lots of really great transformers, but they can also be incredibly stupid. I mean, they're just a tool. Um, so looking at this case, uh, Clang's output, right? Clang pretty much throws up all, all over itself on this particular example, um, and does a naive transformation of this particular loop. Um, at the best, we can say is that I inlined it, right? Okay, great. Um, Visual Studio. Same thing, it's definitely wiping its chin. Um, we're not getting anything, anything like what we would want in the scenario. Um, so what do we do? What's our process in here? How do we help the compiler? Um, so we eliminate, as a rule, right, you want to eliminate ghost reads and writes. You don't want to reread values you already have. You don't want to recall functions when you already have the data. You want to make, you want to tell the compiler the information that, ha you know, that you, as much information as you can, which is to say, I already have this data. You don't need to get it again, right? Start there. Um, so we've pulled out the read of the memory variable and need parent update up outside the loop. Um, and pulled out the call to bar count, because we know that's constant here, up outside the loop. Um, now let's see what the compiler spits out. So, bam. Clang can reason about this, folds the whole thing down to what we would expect. Visual Studio, not so much. Still about the same. Um, so, well, what's the next thing that we can do reasonably? Um, we can, again, <clears throat> Give the compiler as much help as you possibly can. Let's hoist all the loop invariant reads out of these branches. Um, even the super, super obvious ones that should already be in registers, the stuff you go, well, why can't the compiler do that? Do it anyway. Because we say, take the, this need update, right, the value we already pulled out, we already assigned to a value. Let's just hoist that out of the entire loop and see what happens. Okay, Visual Studio finally gets it. Right, and basically can give us the result that we're looking for, can in fact reason about the whole, um, the whole function and optimize it down to what we want. Um, there's a little bit of unnecessary branching here, um, but it's more or less equivalent to the, to the playing version. Um, so in, in general, right, when we're talking C++ particular, um, this applies to any member, view, member fields especially, um, but functions in general and other globals and things that you might be reading. Um, it's not particular to bools, of course. Um, so let's also look at information density and context, right? And what can we, how can we reason about that? And how can we help the compiler? Um, so really simple, again, contrived example, but not something outside the range of something we would actually see. Um, uh, we have this imaginary update function that takes some random value, um, compares it with some chance value that we're storing. Um, if that comparison passes, then we call some spawn function and we reset the, the, the chance value. If not, we increment the chance value by some global constant. Great, really simple, straightforward. Something we should be able to reason about in our heads, right? Um, so when we look at this function, we say, okay, well, it, the, you know, the, the core of this is that branch, is that value, is that thing that decides whether or not we're going to spawn, right? So how can we reason about the information density for this in, is spawn value over time? Um, 
really simple, simple way, this sort of the easy way, is just to print it out. Uh, and you get this, right? Um, and then you zip the output, basically. Print it out, zip the output. Um, zip, you know, the, the purpose of compression is to reduce uh, um, the amount of redundancy, so it tells us a lot about the information density of the, of the data. Um, so in this case, uh, zipping the output over the course of 10,000 frames gives us 915 bytes. Um, let's ignore the fact that there's headers and things like that. It's close enough, right? Um, so uh, 915 bytes times 8 bits divided by 10,000 frames tells us that we have about 0.732 bits of information per frame that we're actually transmitting. Um, Alternatively, right, you can calculate this yourself. You can work it out depending on what information you have. Um, you can calculate the entropy yourself. You know the probability of some of these things. That's up to you how you approach it. But in sort of the, the quick and dirty cheating way, print it out and zip it. Um, so what does this tell us in context? Um, so if we figure conservatively in this function that we have about two L2 cache misses per frame times 10,000 frames, right, over time, uh, um, and each cache line, we assume, uh, 64 bytes. That tells us that we have about uh, 128 bytes times 10,000 frames, or about 1.28 million bytes read um, in order to process this, transform this data over the course of 10,000 frames. But we also know our average information content is about 0.732 bits per frame times 10,000 frames, um, which gives us 915 bytes of information, actual information that we've read over that 10,000 frames. So now we can reason about the amount of waste on our line, right? So the percentage waste in that, in that reading the line from main RAM to L2 in our case, so the noise to signal ratio um, is approximately 99.9% waste, completely wasted noise going over the line. Um, and that helps us reason about what, what we need to do in this transformation. The vast majority, the vast majority by huge margin of the work that's actually being done here is unnecessary, right? We can reason about it, it's just noise. Um, so what are the alternatives in this particular case, right? So per frame, if we're looking at, you know, if we're looking at solving it locally inside the frame, um, we look and say, okay, well I have one bit, effectively, um, out of 512 bits that I need for this particular frame, whether or not that, that, that bool is true. Um, so I'm gonna read this whole cache line, what am I gonna do with the rest of it? Um, well, one simple way is we just make the same decision 512 times, right? We just, if we need to process 512 of these, great. We just pack the whole thing um, with 512 bits, we're good to go. Like that's often, uh, often a reasonable approach. Um, Another approach is I can combine it with other reason transforms. I can put other things in here that I know I'm gonna need at the same time and sort of combine these transforms together. Um, this is generally the simplest. I can, instead of doing one thing, I do two things at once. Um, and, but this, you can't solve this problem in an abstract bubble, right? I have to know what other things I am statistically going to be doing at the same time in order to merge them. Um, so that requires context, that requires information. This has to be, the only way to solve this is sort of with the reality of, of the data that you're working with. Um, another way to solve it is sort of look over frames. This is also sort of a fairly common approach. Um, and only read when you need to read it. So in this case, we would say, well, we know the vast majority of the time, statistically, it's unlikely that we'll actually be doing the spawning, the, the probability is very low, so we're just going to forward that into the future. So if we have, a, if we have say, a, rate, a table of command buffers that get processed, or instruction streams that get processed over time, say over the course of 120 frames, or 512 frames, or whatever, however far you're gonna look into the future, we can calculate when it's going to spawn and then push it into that instruction stream in the future. So that in all the frames between now and then, we're not even thinking about it. We're not processing it, we're not worrying about it, um, and we're just projecting that call into the future. Right, perfectly reasonable approach as well. Um, so let's review some other code to look at. This is just, um, I don't know how many of you know the Ogre engine, it's an open source game engine. Um, not particularly picking on it, just because it's open source and um, it's a fine example to look at. Um, so picking on one particular aspect, this node class. So what, are, you know, what can we tell just by looking at it? Just by looking at this, <coughs> this code here, we sort of what, what problems do we see? 
Um, so immediately I see, you know, we have a lot of member variables filling up. I can assume that this, I can hopefully assume that this represents the vast majority of the member variables in, in the class. Um, I know that I can't, these values can't be rearranged much in memory, right? The compiler can't reason about that. It can't re realistically expect to rearrange these values based on locality of access and the things that I need it to do. It's very limited by the ABI, right? The compiler has to do what it, everything expects it to do. Um, it can't limit unused reads. Like if I'm only going to read one of these values, the rest are going to be in the cache line. The compiler can't reason about that. Like that's just how it is. Um, and extra padding may or may not be in there, right? Depending on how you've said it's set that particular struct to set up. Um, can also look at this and say, that, you know, as we talked about before, there's you know there's a lot of bools in here, um, so there's going to be a lot of last minute decision making going on. Um, a lot of extra complexity, and a lot, certainly, again, all those bools in the struct, we know that's increasing our cost to read anything significantly. We also know, just by the name of this uh, class, that it's overgeneralized, right? Node. Um, and it has this relatively complex constructor, um, which is going to imply a few things. One is going to imply that um, reads are unmanaged, right? It's just sort of a dumping ground for a bunch of stuff. Um, and so nobody thought about, nobody thought about how things are read, when they're going to be read, who's going to read them, and what are the most common transforms. We know that they're unmanaged. We also know by the name, node, that the, the design is this sort of mental model of one at a time. Like this node exists in a vacuum and it's going to do all of its things, and this other node is going to do all of its things. But we also know the reality is there's very rarely, the most common case is not a node, right? The most, the, where do you use nodes? In this scenario, for this, for this particular game engine, uh, it's going to be in sort of an animation hierarchy. I have a hierarchy of nodes. It's the hierarchy that's the common case, right? Having a bunch of them, having them all together in a hierarchy, that's the common case, not an individual node. So what, we, what somebody here has optimized for ostensibly is the sort of genericness of you know, keeping those nodes separate as opposed to the reality of the most common case, which is a hierarchy. Um, we also would see immediately that you know, it's very easy for me to guess that there's going to be a lot of unnecessary reads and writes in the destructors in order to clean up a lot of the stuff. Um, and we know definitively by looking at this um, that we have an unmanaged iCache. Like when you have something very generically named like this, you know, you just know that the intention is so that people can override it with all their bunch of different cases. Um, and that function is supposed to be, you know, is, is virtual and all the updates are virtual and all that. Um, so iCache is completely unmanaged. We have no idea what's getting loaded in, um, you know, what particular instruction set is getting loaded for any particular set of data. It's totally without thought so that we can call this <coughs> update without thinking about it. So we can ignore the actual reality of the problem that we're working with, um, which makes everything slower. Um, we also know immediately by looking at it that we have this sort of unnecessarily complex state machines happening. Um, we have at least seven bools here effectively. So that gives us, that gives us about 120, you know, 128 states at least, given that there's nothing else in, this, you know, in the structure or inside the functions, at least 128 states that we need to manage at any given time um, in this, uh, inside this class. Um, and as a rule of thumb, right, what we want to do is store each state type separately, right? We want to manage states separately. Uh, we want to store same sets together so that we don't need to keep state values at all. That's not, that's not, we, we certainly don't need seven of them. Um, we just store the different combinations together. We can reason about their probability, you know, independently as a group. Um, we also see things like underdefined constraints. Like here, we're assigning a name. We're just, you know, I'm calling the node, you know, empty initializer, um, default constructor. I'm just going to generate some name because, although the reality is, right, the actual common case would be that I'm providing it some name, providing it given some context. And so we're going to ultimately, most likely, be doing a bunch of work here just so that it can be overridden later. Um, implies tons of wasted reads, sort of just under the, this pretext that you're pretending like you don't know what's going to be happening with this class, right? Um, and strings generally have this property. Strings are generally bad. Um, file names in particular, people like to pretend like they don't know what files they can be working with. Um, 
And you know, a rule of thumb, uh, as always, is that the best code is code that doesn't need to exist at all. Um, so do it offline, um, but, you know, do it once, pre-compile -comp pre -pre hash, string hashes, whatever you need to do, sort of push it back in time. Um, and in here, we also see an example of sort of oversolving or computing way too much. Um, so, you know, we've done this default structure, and now we've said, it needs to update. We can imagine what's going to happen there. It's sort of going to propagate. One single node in the hierarchy is going to propagate down and say, okay, all my children need to be updated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, although, you know, it's in this default constructor, and we can, we can reason about the entire result of that transformation. We know it statically. Um, but, you know, with a certain amount of complexity, what we saw previously with this, you know, even a small amount of complexity and these two functions that we could reason about in our head, the compiler can very easily get lost in the depth of it. And so this is, is never going to be able to reason about this. Um, and it's just not going to be able to flatten it out. And it's going to generate the actual work for this statically knowable result um, uh, unnecessarily. Um, but, you know, we're programmers. So we can make tools to do this for us. Like we shouldn't fear sort of generating, generate the code that does that, that pre-computes it and just put it in there. Um, and common cases for us are pre-multiplying matrices. You know, we do, we have a set of transforms that we do in code and then we can take it offline, transform them, and spit out the code that does just them, you know, in one go. Um, so we work, you know, work with the actual data you have, know if you have sparse or a fine matrices, um, and you can, you know, just solve for those problems, generate code that just solves for those problems, um, whatever you want to do. So how do we approach, approach fixing this kind of scenario? Right? So let's, let's take this function. Um, no translate, just another example. Nothing special about it, nothing unusual about this. I'm not picking on something partic that's particularly bad. It's a very common kind of function. Um, so we have this switch here. Um, and it's not a bool, but it sort of fits in the same context of last minute decision making, right? It's inside of one single node trying to reason about its context alone. Even though it's part of a larger hierarchy, even though the calling context probably knows what case this is for the entire hierarchy, it's still trying to reason about it in this sort of last minute. Um, and it's doing that because that's our model of the world, right? We've had this mental model that the node reasons about this together, and we're paying a heavy price for that, for just for that mental model. Um, so the first thing we do to transform this is sort of organize the states so that they're separate, so that we can reason about them at least, right? And so if we go back here, we have local transform, local transform, world transform, and parent transform cases here. Um, so let's just separate them so that we can reason about them. Um, so three functions or member functions or how we want to do it. Um, and each one of these, because we know what we want to reason about is a whole hierarchy of transforms, um, we say, okay, I'm going to take not just a node, but I'm going to take a list of nodes so that I can reason about what I'm doing. A list of nodes that I am going to transform, lo translate locally, a list of them by, in world space, a list of them in parent space. Um, so, uh, we want, what we want to do next, of course, is once we have that separated, we want to be able to, we just need to triage, right? We need to figure out where is our time best spent in, in, in um, where do, you know, where do we want to spend time actually solving what problem? And that is based on real, real data, right? We have to know the probability of these functions being called um, roughly and the count, you know, the number of times they're called. Um, and we can make back of the envelope estimates. We, we, we can um, improve those estimates over time when we're looking at real world data, but we have to at least have some idea of that probability and that call count in order to make reasoned decisions about how we're going to, what we're going to concentrate on. Um, and if we, you know, there's different contexts. Like for us, we have two very different contexts. We have a sort of in-game context and an editor context. And those are very different. And in this particular transform case, in-game, it would be very common statistically common for us to move a lot of things by different translations. And a lot of things are moving in, in different, um, by different amounts in different places. Um, in the context of a, an editor, it would be extremely common for us to move a lot of things by the same translation. So you grab a bunch of things in the editor and you translate them all together. Um, it's two different contexts, two different, entirely different problems um, that we would need to solve separately. Um, so let's just take one of them. Let's say this one be, is the most significant one. Um, and so our third step would be 
to pick it and say reduce waste on the most common, the most statistically common case. Um, and that's the thing we, we concentrate on first. We concentrate on the most statistically common case first. Um, so back of the envelope, read cost, we'll say it's about two cash lines per count. It's about 400 cycles per count in the loop. So that's the back of the envelope. Um, so how do we improve that? Well, a very straightforward transformation, right? Um, we take the stuff that we're actually reading, the position, the orientation, uh, and we precondition it so that it's inside this kind of struct to pack them together. Um, and so now we can fill up a whole cache line, multiple cache lines with just the data that we actually need to read. Um, so that gives us about 2.28 loops per cache line, um, which is significantly better. So now we need to reason about what the cost of our actual other instructions is in here, and that's, so that's about 88 cycles per loop. So we look at this uh, uh, operator overloaded function here, which is a great example of how operator overloading obfuscates what's the work that's actually happening. It's very difficult to reason about. Um, so here we know this, we're doing a quaternion by vector multiply, so what does that translate into? If you know, we do this every day, we're probably familiar with what it transforms into. So we can just eyeball this amount of work. Say, so yeah, that's in the, in the, at least in the order of magnitude of 88 cycles, right? Um, so it's about right. Um, be, beyond this point, um, we would need to dig in and measure, but we know back at the envelope, we're in about the right order of magnitude. So we've focused on the most common case, we've gotten into the right order of magnitude, and at this point is when we would or we would decide whether or not we, we actually dig in um, and we do more significant optimizations or not, or it's good enough. Um, but we also apply the same steps recursively, right? We split up, this, we have this other case, let's say this was the most statistically common case, translate, um, uh, translate in the world space, itself has this um, last minute read of whether or not the node has a parent. Um, so again, we want to separate states that we can reason, separate states so that we can reason about them. Whether or not this node is the root, which is what is implied by it not having a parent, um, the calling function definitely knows in context. Um, and the calling function can distinguish this, right? But we've, because of our mental model of the world, we've sort of pushed this into the, the code here. And every node, every transform has to pay this cost, this check. For data, we clearly know outside, outside this function. Uh, so we split it up into two cases, transforming the roots, um, which we can do across hierarchies, um, and transforming um, nodes with parents, which is the vast majority of nodes in a hierarchy, right? all except the top one. Um, so now we look at that as the most statistically common case, um, and it's difficult, we want to reason about the cost here. It's difficult for us to reason about the cost, there's a lot of function method calls happening in here. Um, it's not quite clear what's, what's going on, so what we need to do is get some clarity. So in this case, what we would probably do is precondition the data. Right? We would call, the, if, those if those functions are obfuscated or whatever, um, we can't get to actual data, we would precondition it by creating a stream, just go through, create our stream uh, of packed data that we, that we actually want, right? Which is, you know, in this particular case, is sort of the, the, um, the orientation inverse, the drive scale, the child count, and then we would just pack um, child positions, but the number of them r relative to that child count. Um, and then we iterate over those, right? Um, so that we know that the data that we're reading is actually packed into each other, that we're making at least reasonable use of that channel. Um, so the good news, looking at these sort of things, is that most problems that we're going to be dealing with um, are really easy to see. Like we can do this kind of back of the envelope analysis, we can just look at the code, spend two minutes, um, we can reason about it, it's really easy to see um, and work, on, you know, and conceptualize what the problems are given our finite set of hardware. And a side effect of solving the 90% problem really well is that the compiler gets better and better at solving that 10% of the problem that it can solve. Other good news is that <coughs> really organized data makes maintenance, debugging, and concurrency in particular much, much easier. You know what to expect, you know it's here, you know how it's packed, you know how it's organized, you know how long it should take. Um, you know how to change it, you can reason about the cost of changing it, um, you can view it all together. Um, it, it simply makes things much easier to work with. The bad news, as always, is that good programming is hard, and bad programming is really, really easy. 
Um, so truths are that hardware is the platform, the reality of what we're working with. Um, that we design around the data, uh, not an idealized world. Um, that our main responsibility as programmers is to transform data. We solve that first, not the code design. So let's bring it all back to C++. Um, good. The good is that we generally have enough tools to reason about the most important part of the problem, memory and the data. We have access to it. We can reason about it. We can move things around. Um, the bad news is we generally also have a culture that thinks ignoring the real problem uh, is a good thing. More and more things get piled on uh, in order to hide how memory is accessed, in order to hide how memory is arranged, in order to hide by far the most significant problem that we deal with. Um, and while we're on the subject of the culture of C++, I would like to end with a quote from Krista Erickson, who is the former, now former, director of technology at Sony Santa Monica. Um, and if you haven't read it, the author of Real Time Collision Detection. Uh, design, patter design patterns are spoon fed material for brainless programmers incapable of independent thought who will be resolved to producing code as mediocre as the design patterns they use to create it. The end. So we have a few minutes for questions, tomatoes, whatever. Uh, <clears throat> hi, uh, uh, excellent talk. Thank you very much. I have a, just a couple of questions. Um, <clears throat> re regarding the, the beginning of the talk where you said you don't use STL, you're against templates and all those things. I, I'm, I'm not here to throw tomatoes at you. I just want to understand the, uh, how do you then uh, deal with the code duplication that you will get into if you don't you know, use templates to, to replicate functionality that you would use across a library. And uh, the second question is, um, all the examples on optimizing for the cache line are extraordinary. It's very, very interesting. I totally agree with that. But it, I find it extremely hard to do when we're on different platforms that are not, we don't have any idea where the program is going to get run and how big the cache line is going to be or anything like that. OK, so, sorry. Let yeah, me so interrupt we'll, you before we'll, I get lost. All right. First one, <laughs> templates. How do you remove code duplication? Well, one, it's almost certainly not as big a problem as people think it is. They invent things to duplicate in order so they can invent templates to solve the problem. Um, but in the cases where it is potentially useful, you can also generate the code. Like a template is just a poor man's text process. Like we have tons of stuff that processes text. Like you can actually do a really great job with some other tool that does it better, right? You don't need templates in order to solve that problem. So that's one question. Uh, the other question was, I, I have so many platforms and I don't know the characteristics of those platforms. Um, that's not true. I mean, it may be true you don't know, um, but it's not true that there isn't a finite set of characteristics, there's a finite set of range, right? Um, it's going to be within some range. You should know the min, you should know the max, you should know the average of the range of the things that you're likely to be dealing with. You should know the common case. Um, it's not likely that what you know, that you're trying to solve the problem well for both, again, like you're not gonna be putting the same solution on, say, a Z80 and on Google Server Farm. Right? It's unlikely that this is going to solve that range of problem space. Um, so what is the finite space you're working with? What is the finite set of, of say, chip design that you're going to probably be working with? What are the requirements for those? You know, you know, does it even require an MMU? You know, that sort of thing. Like, there is this finite set of requirements that you have to have. You need to articulate them. You need to understand what that range is. Um, because port, this sort of idea of general portability is a fool's errand, honestly. Thank you very much. I'll skip over here and then come back. Hi. Have you uh, written any tools to help you identify these sort of problems? And will you share them with us if you have? Uh, um, uh, I mean, we have lots of sort of ad hoc tools. We also do some analysis and stuff, you know, with, with our performance. We can look at it and we can reason about it. But generally speaking, I mean, when you're looking at um, at the basic level, you know, how, how um, am I using cache lines, right? That's a pretty easy thing to, to reason about, right? Your, whatever, the, whatever the profiler you're using is can probably tell you your cache um, miss rate, right? And so you can take your cache miss rate on a particular function over a particular set of time and just look at the number of reads that you're doing and, and just calculate it. How, given this many reads and given this many cache misses, how much of this data am I actually using it, right? So it doesn't require a real sophisticated set of tools. Thanks. Yes. Uh, I, just want, I just wanted to ask, uh, like, uh, let's say I have a large code base that was developed in, with a mindset 
completely uh, far from that the oriented design. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any tip or resource that can help us uh, get into the right mindset and understand how can we uh, fix that code base and expand upon it using this kind of design? Uh, how do you fix a code base that's a, you know, a gigantic code base that hasn't reasoned about the data at all? Uh, one step at a time. Like one, that's all you can do. Right? Take take one step at a time. I would say, the you know, pick anything, anything at all. Start anywhere and start to reason about it. Right? Dump out the data. Reason about you know the reason about the the actual information density there. Reason about the the um, cache usage and capacity of the line. Reason about it definitively, clearly, and just let it move out from there. Right? But start anywhere. Just start. Don't think that you have to do all of it all everywhere. Right? Find the most common case and start there. That's the, that's the process that we do. Figure out what the most common transform is and start there. Thank you very much. I just wanted to make an observation. Um, you, know, you said something about how this is not a new problem, not a new thing. Um, Fred Brooks said a long time ago, show me your code, I won't know what you're doing. Show me your tables, which is Cobol speak for how you organize your data. I won't need to see your code. Yeah, sure. So. If I know what the input, I know what the output is, there's only so many ways I can get between them. Right. Yes, it's, this is not news, right? Absolutely. Thanks. <clears throat> As I was uh, listening to your talk, I, <clears throat> excuse me, realized that uh, you were working in a different kind of environment than I work in. You were working in a very time-constrained, hardware-constrained environment. As we all know, the hardware, when you specify the hardware as the platform, that's true because that's the API the hardware exposes to a developer that's, that's working inside the chip on the embedded code, that's the level at which the, is the platform. Ideally, I suspect that the level of the platform should be the level at which you can abstract your problem to the maximal efficiency. So I have a, a library, for example, that allows me to write code for both Linux and Windows. I have no problem with that. Our company uses primary constraint is engineering resources. I mean, <clears throat> we don't worry so much about the time because it's all user interface stuff. Did, we sir. worry about how long it takes a programmer to develop a piece of code in a given length of time. So we don't care about all that stuff. If we can write a map in one sentence, and get the value out, we don't care really how long it takes, as long as it's, you know, okay, big great. O of- You don't care out. how long it takes, great. But you, why, people who don't care about how long it takes is also the reason why I have to wait 30 seconds for Word to boot, for instance. <laughs> but you know, whatever, that's your constraint. I mean, I don't feel that's orthogonal to what we do. We worry about our resources. We have to get shit out. We have to make, you know, we have to build this stuff on time. We worry about that. What we focus on, what we focus on though, is the most valuable thing that we can do. We focus on understanding the actual constraint of the problem. Where can we actually spend the time to make it valuable for ultimately for our player or for whoever your user is? That's where we want to bring the value. And performance matters a lot to us. But I would say in any context, for me personally, if I was to be dropped into the business software development model, I don't think my mindset would change very much because the performance matters to users as well in whatever they're doing. That's my view. Yes. Uh, hi. Um, what, what do you think about portability? I mean, even in your uh, area, I mean, you, you have to support the, the, the PlayStation 3, the PlayStation 4, the Xbox, there's differences. I mean, you're, you're basically optimizing for one platform, right? So mm, when, yes when, and no. I mean, you, we're, we can't. We often do optimize for one platform, but we also optimize for a finite set of platforms, right? Again, we reason about it. This is the range. You know, it's not. It's not. The range is not 6502 to sell, right? The range is smaller than that, um, and so we can 
get something that works roughly well inside that range, right? We can, we can reason about that. Yeah, if you knew that before, but say you, you wrote an engine for the PS3 and now you're moving it to the PS4. Right. That, that sounds like it's a lot more effort the way you do it than if you were just to think about the, the problem doesn't before. change. It's not the way we do it. It's, the, it's what we do is solve the reality of the problem. The problem hasn't. You know, the fact. The problem is that you've moved from PS3 to PS4. Like that's the actual problem. You can ignore the problem of what, what's actually on that hardware. That doesn't get you anywhere. You've just ignored it. Like so. The, the comparison is, if I ignore the problem, I get less, or if I reason about it, I could potentially at least get more. I'm gonna take, the, I'm gonna take door B, Bob. Okay, so uh, you've shown us some nice examples of transforming data, and um, <clears throat> I find that that style of code is very easy to do a query or a transformation, as long as you're dealing with abs almost absurdly simple data, like an array. <clears throat> If you're dealing with an array, almost all these problems are very easy to solve. But if you have data that is too big to just fit one big array, you need to start, start thinking about B trees and other more complicated data structures to manage access to memory. You can't just do a for loop. It's like it gets a lot more complicated and the code gets more complicated and it's kind of like a complicated a problem, right? Sorry, to if I can if I can summarize what you're saying, hard problems are hard. It's kind of what you're saying, right? Yes, as data gets more complicated, the, the, the complexity of reasoning about it gets more complicated because the problem is harder. Well, what I'm saying is that even if you're thinking about data, like if the data is the problem, the representation of the data is also part of the problem. And of course it'd be it nice is. If I mean, you're reasoning kind of about separated. how that data is accessed. You're reasoning about the cost of that access. Yes, that's the point. And more complex, more complex systems require more complex um, reason, right? You have to figure out, okay, well, you know, I have a lot more stuff going on. Whether or not, you know, B-tree is not a particularly complex example, but whatever you're working with, and whatever for whatever reason, you're, reason, you're doing a reason cost benefit analysis there. You're doing it for a reason, right? You're trying to get something out of it, and you have to reason about the cost of each one of those operations, how I'm jumping around this tree, how I'm analyzing the section of the tree, whatever you're doing, you have to be re able to reason about those costs in order to know whether or not you're getting the benefit that you're trying to get by putting that structure there in the first place. So yes, you do, you do that too. You do that in those places. We certainly have complex data structures in the game engine. So um, what you're saying is if the, if the algorithms need to depend on the representation, if the representation changes, rewrite all the algorithms? If the data changes, you have a different problem. If you have a different problem, you use a different algorithm. Yes, so of course. Okay, thank you. Sorry, one more over here. Uh, this is maybe less a comment, or less a question than a comment, but uh, I noticed the, in, the, in the middle of your talk when you were uh, taking that, that big node structure and chopping it up into little arrays, and then you gave some advantages of it, and one of them was maintainability, which I think is counterintuitive for some of us, but uh, how, how perhaps I interpreted that, and I, I wonder if you could say if this is correct, is that part of maintainability is also uh, robustness against future bad refactorings. If I have a big structure and someone says, aha, I need to add an extra bool here, let me stick it in the middle, suddenly that ruins your cache lines and you have a performance regression and then you have to go find out why. That's certainly part right? of it. Another part of it is just, you know, maintain, part of maintainability is your ability to quickly reason about what's happening, right? And when you have, uh, basically 120 different states all happening in this function, this particular function that's trying to do all of these, read all these different rules and manage all the different states, it's very difficult to look at it and reason about it. It's very common for people to just look at a function and go, I don't know what the hell this function is actually doing because there's so many branches and all these states and potentially thousands of different states and potentially different things happening, right? I can't reason about it. It makes it much more difficult to maintain. If you have something with very few states, it's easier to maintain because it's easier to reason about. Back over here. Uh, in, interesting perspective on C++. Now, my question will be, what is your rationale f to use C++? Why don't you just stick with C? Okay, well, if we want to go there, <laughs> my personal preference in, I say this in, knowing I'm at CPCon, would be C99, for sure. Um, but, uh, the, I mean, the rationale is really culture, cultural, right? It's, it's over, the, say, the last 15 years that C++ has become culturally dominant. Um, and so we accept that. That's just the truth. And so we work with it. Yes. Um, 
as we're moving to newer standards and we're now having C++ 11 as I think. Sorry, can you start over? Sorry. Um, as we're moving um, with C++ to newer standards, um, is your industry moving with us using newer C++ 11 features like, I don't know, move semantics, R value references? To a degree, I would say yes. I mean, but as you've already seen, there's a lot of stuff that even existing in, you know, in, in 98 that we avoid. Um, and we, we carefully evaluate things, you know, for, for advantage, cost, anything that, you know, that, so, so long as it is beneficial, we would use it. It's a tool. If it's not beneficial or it's harmful, we're not going to use it because. Um, so yes, I mean, it's there, it's a tool, so long as it works in the compilers that, that we would actually have, then you know, us and any other team are going to evaluate it on its face. Like, does, it bring, does it bring the benefit it ostensibly is supposed to bring, or does it get in our way? We certainly won't use a language feature just for the hell of it, or just for the sake of using a language feature. Again, software is not the platform, right? Yes? Uh, what benefits are you getting out of C++ versus C or assembly? Um, Again, culturally, right? People are accustomed to it. Um, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not the person to ask that question. Hi, I'm. I'm curious if, uh, like, on the uh, the current, the now current gen consoles and the newer tool chains, uh, did. Does using C++ 11 there and like getting copy elision and a few other things, did that have any kind of tangible effects on performance for you guys? No. Um, none at all? No. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I have an answer for you, actually, to sort of step back. C++ advantages. Um, MSVC has a very poor history of supporting C. So there you go. Advantage of using C++ is that it's actually supported by MSVC. Uh, the other question I had uh, on, on modern tool chains is, do you guys use link time optimization or profile guided optimization as part of what you do? And Generally, no, only because it's so crappy. It's so slow, unbelievably slow. LTO or PGO or it's both? It's just really crap. But, uh, you know, it's not like we haven't made passes on it. It's just such garbage that, yes, we, have, we don't generally put it into our pipeline. Okay, what's, what's garbage about, like the code generation or the fact that it slows your link it's down? It's so and, slow, unbelievably okay. slow. And it, the linkers are generally already so slow. Right. Um, that, you know, it's just a poor environment to begin with and now we've said, let's put, put a right. whole bunch more on there for essentially a marginal benefit. Um, so yeah, it's not really part of our normal daily pipeline. It sounds like you should have come to my build acceleration talk on, you know. on Monday. <laughs> Most of my tips probably, I probably suspect that everybody should probably <laughs> pay attention to that. Thank you. Yes. Anything else? We're good? All right. Thank you.